Hello, and welcome to episode 237 of The Joy of Coding. My name is Mike Conley. It's so good to have you here. I'm so excited to get started today working on some Firefox stuff. Uh, uh, let's, let's just dive right into it. And let me share my screen. So, uh, let's see. Let's pull up today's agenda. Today is the 13th of January, 2021. It's episode 237. And for those of you who are new, maybe you haven't heard me say this before, um, no plan survives breakfast. I think I know what I want to do today, even though I haven't really put anything in the today section of the agenda yet. I, I think I know what I want to do today, uh, but it's very sort of vague. I don't know how it's going to go. We might end up fixing some stuff. We might end up getting rat holed down some kind of, uh, you know, blind alley. Who knows? None of this is really pre-planned beyond just a vague notion. We're capturing real software development in the raw. So if things go wrong or if it seems like we're stuck, that's okay. That's part of the plan. That's the first thing. Second thing, the agenda that we're looking at is something you have access to, uh, which is pretty handy if you want to click on any of the links. So if you are watching this on YouTube, check out the video description. If you're watching this on Air Mozilla, check out I think it's the video description or the event description. And if you're watching this on uh, Twitch, then I'm going to drop the link into the Twitch chat right now. Twitch chat and Matrix. Because they're bridged now. I, I'm bridging Matrix and, and the Twitch chat. So huzzah. Hopefully that comes through. Um, I want to briefly talk about the episode guide. So the episode guide is a completely viewer-driven resource for people who are watching the stream. Uh, maybe you want to know what happened in a past episode. Maybe you want to know what happened in this episode because you're watching this in the future. Uh, there is an episode guide, and you can read through these to get links to things like the link to the episode and the link to the agenda and like what got covered, what bugs... Um, things we talked about, links for rating the episode, that sort of thing. And uh, it's completely viewer-driven. I don't think I've written an episode guide in years. It's almost entirely, uh, you know, contributed to by, by volunteers, viewers just like you. So thank you so much for the people who have been contributing. In fact, if I remember correctly, uh, there are some pull requests. Uh, first of all, there is a dependency to bump for the Adzo stuff. The Adzo, if you don't recall, maybe you're new here, Adzo was an attempt. Uh, I, I'd say it's still an interesting project, but I haven't really spent much time on it in the past couple of years, but it's an attempt to use the Mozilla Deep Speech um, system to automatically transcribe uh, Joy of Coding episodes. We did, I think, a decent, a fair amount of the, uh, the episodes with Deep Speech, and it worked out all right. But I more or less paused that effort because uh, I, I don't know why. I, I guess I just decided to pause it. I, I, I kind of lost interest, but maybe I'll come back to it someday. I do have a pull request from Smurf D for episode 235. Let's take a quick peek at that right now. Maybe, uh, you know, we can merge this in right now. So let's take a quick peek. Uh, so whenever I'm reviewing these episodes... Uh, these episode guide entries, what I like to do is make sure that the date's right. So it was 2020, uh, the December 16th. That sounds right, but let's take a quick look at my uh, my notes here. December 16th, that's right. And it was episode 235, and we make sure that the uh, link looks right. Now, because I know how the short links work, I know that this link is correct. So uh, I'm pretty happy about uh, the readable uh, short links that we're getting now. And we'll just make sure that the Evernote agenda is connected to the right one. Yep, that's good. And then what did we cover? Pandemic edition. Uh, it was the last episode of the year. We talked about Alessandro Castellani's uh, Thunderbird hacking streams. We talked about Share Backported, which is an add-on that I use. It adds this little airplane here so I can share things. Um, we talked about title versus sentence case. I think it's actually going to be useful for today's episode as well because we'll probably be doing some more sentence case stuff today. And then I talked about some of the tools that I use. I also linked to my uh, my research paper that I did for my master's degree, for better or worse. So check that out if you care. So this all looks great. I'm going to merge this in. Uh, the way I do that, I just go like merge pull request, confirm merge, and I say thanks because you always want to thank your contributors. And that's it. 235 is added. Let's now um, 
shift our focus, uh, start thinking about Firefox and what we're going to be doing today. Uh, there are a couple things we can do. Um, the first one is actually a little bit of um, sort of pilot work. Um, you know, by pilot, what do I mean? I mean like scouting. So this is something that maybe you've uh, you've um, had to do in your own projects. Uh, if you're a tech lead or someone who's like kind of doing some research and development, scouting is is kind of in that vein where you're not trying to build a prototype necessarily but you're trying to lay get a sense of the topology of a particular problem space and a potential solution to see whether or not the idea of a solution the mechanisms that you have in mind are going to work so you kind of like test things out you write some quick and dirty patches you don't really design them to be landable out the gate but you just see how far you can get um, to see what kind of obstacles you might hit um, that you will only actually encounter whenever you're actually trying to do the work and this kind of piloting work is really handy if you're going to hand off the work. You can kind of like prepare a document and say like, okay, here are the problems that we're going to have to deal with here. Um, it's almost like drilling a pilot hole. I mean, that's why I call it piloting or scouting. It's like drilling a pilot hole for, you know, before you put in like the big drill bit. And uh, we might do some of that today. I also have four things in my review queue that we might want to review. Um, let's see. And then we've got more sentence case work. I got some feedback on things that we want to do with uh, some strings. So I'm going to just pick one at random. Piloting, code review, or sentence case. Let's do a couple of code reviews to start. Let's just take a look at what we've got in my review queue, just to kind of warm our brains up. We got a couple things in here, uh, a couple that are. Um, oh, I see, opening on top of one another. So there's a patch here. Let's review this one. So uh, you may or may not know this, but uh, one of our uh, students from Michigan State who was working on Firefox, the picture-in-picture -picture feature last semester, made it possible to have multiple picture-in-picture -picture player windows. So if you're not sure what I mean by that, if you go to YouTube, you can like open up a couple of different tabs and like, I'm gonna play a video here. I'm gonna just mute that. And I can open this in picture-in-picture -picture, and I'll put that here. It opened on my other display, which is why I had to drag it over. And then uh, if I open up this, video in picture in picture I can actually open up a second picture in picture player window and uh, the thing the part of the problem is that if you close uh, a picture in picture player window say um, say I close both of them and then I reopen them notice it's going back to the last place that the player window closed that's something new that we added we remember the size and Relative, uh, relative size and position of the player windows now. Now I'm going to open up this one. And notice it overlaps the old video. That's because we save at the point where you close the window. You know, when, when with the last player window that we closed was in this position. It was the, the SpongeBob video. And we are retrieving that information uh, whenever we open up the second one. And now we have this weird case where we've got this one video overlapping this other video, and that's almost certainly not what the user wants. The user is probably wanting to watch both things at the same time, and that's very difficult to do when they're overlapping one another. Now, obviously, we don't want to prevent users from overlapping videos. Uh, you know, maybe they want to overlap them. That's fine. But by default, when you open them, overlapping them is probably less useful. So we have this patch that uh, one of the students wrote to prevent them from opening on top of one another when you're doing multiple picture-in-picture -picture player windows. And I wanted to take a quick peek at the patch, see how it works, uh, test it out a little bit, um, and, and maybe we can, we can get a review for this in. So let's see how this works. Yeah. Kind of pump up the font here so you can read along with me. Hello, everybody. I'm seeing a lot of highs coming from Twitch, Danny Colon, Smurf D, great to see you. So inside of the open pip window function inside of picture in picture, this is the this is the actual um, 
this is the function that does the work of actually constructing the picture in picture player window in the parent process and it looks like hunter that's the that's the fellow who wrote this patch has added a new method called resolve overlap conflicts and so what is happening is we figure out the dimensions and the position of the player window that we probably want based on the size of the video because you know the video will inform the size and position of the player window and maybe the previous um, position of the of the player window that's going to inform us of the top left width and height and then there's this function that's like resolve the overlap conflicts by passing in um, those values left top width and height and getting resolve left and resolve top to get a new resolve left and resolve top um, x and y uh, uh, coordinates new x and y coordinates and then passing those in to the um, the string that actually positions the window okay so I think the that makes sense we just need to understand what this function does so it's taking in the one window like the the suggested the the potential position and dimensions of the newly opened window and it's returning some new uh, coordinates let's see how it works so one of the, this is great. There's a nice doc string here. Let's read this. When passing the dimensions of a picture in picture window that is still being opened, this function will resolve a better placement location for this pip window. If a pre-existing pip window conflicts with it visually overlaps, if no conflicts occur, the pass location is returned. Okay. There's probably a, there's probably a clear way of describing that. And I might, let's suggest, let's suggest, um, uh, this might be clear. Uh, uh, this function uh, takes the size, uh, takes uh, in uh, let's see this function. will take the potential uh, location, size and potential location of a new picture-in-picture -picture window, window, and try to return uh, alternate, uh, return the location coordinates that will best ensure that the player window will not overlap with other pre-existing player windows. I think that's clear. Is that clear? When past the dimensions of a picture in picture window that is still being opened, because it's not just the dimensions, it's the placement. This function will resolve a better placement location if a pre-existing pip window conflicts with it visually overlaps. This function will take the size and potential location of a new picture-in-picture -picture player window and try to return the location coordinates that will best ensure that the player window will not overlap with other pre-existing player windows. I think that's clearer. Okay. Uh, param left x position X position of left edge for picture in picture window that is being opened. That's clear. Y position of top edge for picture in picture window that is being opened. Yes. Width of picture in picture window that is being opened. Height of picture in picture window that is being opened. Those are very clear. Uh, returns a list of left top coordinates to where the past picture in picture window should be opened. Uh, interestingly, uh, we're returning a uh, we're turning an array. That's interesting. We're, t we're returning an array, and I wondered if I wonder if maybe instead of returning an array, it might make more sense to return an object with like top and left, uh, resolve top and resolve left as as properties. Um, let's let's go in and see how this works, though. Okay, so we take those uh, those arguments, left top width and height, and we're gonna create uh, an array of rects and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to iterate all of the play picture in picture player windows window type is a is a global um, variable in this module that describes the identifier for the player window type the picture in picture player window type so what this effectively is doing is just 
iterating all of the pre-existing player windows. Which reminds me is that we only want to do this. Um, we can probably shortcut this if the uh, if we're only opening single player windows. Um, we can probably shortcut all of this if there's, I believe. A variable like a preference multiple allow multiple if is multi pip enabled probably shortcut all of this if this dot multi pip enabled is false and just return left and top okay but then, if it's true, if, if multi-pip is enabled, then we will um, get all of the pre-existing windows and then construct rectangles. Um, so we have this module that's being imported here called geometry. At the top, this is just a utility um, module for doing basic geometry with things like rectangles, points, um, polygons maybe? I'm not sure, but we're, we're constructing rectangles based on the dimensions of the player window, and it's using the screen X and Y positions uh, for uh, X and Y, the, the top and the left, and then outer width and outer height for the player windows. That makes sense, and then we add that to the uh, we add that to the um, array of player rects. Um, I'm going to say there's a knit here. Um, knit, we can probably just directly add the newly created object like player rect.push new geometry.rect. Do we ever use geometry, anything else um, from geometry? We use geometry point and geometry rec. You know what? We should, let's, instead of importing the whole geometry, let's just take the pieces that we need, point and, point and rec. So something like um, const rect point equals that new rect and then passing in the player win dot screen x Player win dot screen y. Player win dot outer width. Player win dot outer height. I believe we can also do code fencing like this to say this is JavaScript, and that will, yeah, that will um, render it more nicely. It will do a little bit of syntax highlighting, at least with the new. Um, we can do the same thing up here. Lang equals JS. Okay. And then uh, after it's done constructing the rects for the old uh, the old players or the pre-existing players, it constructs a rect for the new player. And then what it's going to do is try and go through the player rects and see if any of them intersect the new player rect. And if it finds one, if it finds one conflict, then it will, well, first of all, it will, how does this work? So if it doesn't find any conflicting rects, then we turn left and top. That's fine. Um, if we do find a conflicting rect, then we get the center of the conflicting rectangle. We get the screen that the rectangle is on. We get the available screen size. We get the... We create a rectangle based on the available screen. 
we find the we're going to construct some edge candidates so the way you do that is you construct points where we subtract okay it's geometry time we this is a function where it will return an array of points based on some rectangle that you pass in and what it's going to do is subtract the width of the new rectangle from the left of what's you, what you pass in. So you pass in a rectangle and what it will do is it's going to find the relative I don't know I don't understand why we're doing the subtraction here and then we add the rect right we add the width all right well let's see how this is called and maybe it'll become clearer so we've got our conflict we've got our screen rect and then what we're going to do is we're going to go through the existing player rects And then we're going to pass in that rect. Oh, I understand what it's doing. So each of these is a candidate for, like an X and Y candidate for where to position the new window. The first, so for each window, we're going to check the if we can place the window to the left of it we're going to check to see if we could place it directly to the right of it we're going to check to see if we can place it to above and but okay i understand what he's doing so this function will return the four uh coordinates xy coordinate points corresponding to a particular pre-existing window because we're basically scanning around a window to see if there's a, a convenient place to put it around the window. Um, oh yeah, so Smurf D is saying, take out some paint program and draw to clarify. All right, well, uh, I think Evernote allows me to do a bit of drawing now. Maybe, um, do I have a code reviews? I close code reviews. Active code reviews. What? Okay, Evernote's been very strange to me lately, and I'm not entirely certain what I'm going to do with it. But let's go to active code reviews and analyses. We're going to add a new one. Uh, new note. We're going to call it. Um, this. And then we're going to, uh, you want me to draw. Okay, so the way that we can draw, here I'll collapse. Can I collapse this list? Uh, how do I can expand more? Okay, and then I'm going to draw. I think I've seen this before in here. Insert, sketch, okay. So basically what's happening, I believe, is that supposing we have, I wish I had a, a, a Wacom tablet. So suppose we have these pre-existing picture-in-picture windows. And let's also suppose we have, uh, green will be the screen. Now we're going to number these uh, windows. Call this one one. Say this one's two. Oh, come on. Can I undo that? All right. Two, three. I'm doing this with a mouse, so please forgive me. And four. Okay. 
So uh, let's say we are iter we are iterating the uh, the windows in this order, the pre-existing player windows. We've, we know the dimensions of the window that we're trying to open. And let's say it tries to open it like this. Let's say that the last window we opened was this one, or the last window that we closed, rather, was was right here. It's it's so I'm gonna use what color? I'll use purple. And uh, I wish I had like a oh I have rectangles up here. I could probably just snap to shape. Whatever. Um, suppose uh, we've got our potential player window that could be like this, and it's gonna overlap too. So instead, what we do is we start iterating our windows and we check for each window, we're going to check each edge and say, hey, uh, could I fit the candidate window here? Um, let's see what order it does it in. Left, top, right, bottom. So it's going to check left over here first, say like, hey, can I fit it here? And let's say that it will, uh, if we try and do that, it'll overlap four. So we'll say, no, we can't do that. So we'll try top. Nope, we are outside the bounds. Then right. And let's say that that intersects three. And then we'll try bottom. Um, would put it here and let's say that that also intersects three so we're gonna say no none of that is useful we're not gonna oh man i should not have done dotted lines undoing this is gonna be a pain um i will do better in the future i will not do dotted lines so w trying to place it around one is out so let's try two um and let's say uh it's gonna try and i'll snip what did these do? Reset zoom. These allow me to do just like straight lines if I were to like hold shift. Oh, that's handy. Okay, so let's uh, let's say that uh, we move on to window two now. So it's gonna try, what was the first coordinate? It was gonna be left. Let's just say it tries left first. So it tries putting it here. And guess what? We've got a perfect candidate. This is a great spot to put the window. And so it's going to pick here. I think that's how it works. Um, so there's some chatter. I'm not entirely certain what I'm looking at. This Oh, turtle. Oh, man. Turing? That's, that's a blast from the past. I remember working on that stuff at school when I was young. Okay, I think that's how this thing's gonna work. I'm assuming that based on my read so far of how this thing looks. So for each of the pre-existing windows, we're going to check to see if we have a candidate. Um, so the way that works is we generate the candidate positions, we generate the candidate rectangle we make sure that we're inside of the screen we make sure that if there's any intersection we bail out otherwise we get the candidate rect center distance to conflict we get the distance to conflict Oh, I see. We're going to find the closest one. So we're going to find the one. This is interesting. I didn't realize we were going to do this. We're going to find all these candidate locations. We're not just going to go with the first one. We're going to find all of the candidate locations. And then we're going to measure the distance between where we were originally going to go and all of the candidate positions. And we'll choose the shortest path would be my guess. Sort the closest. Um, so this assumes that there's going to be a candidate. Um, 
this assumes that we're going to find a candidate location and that candidate locations I'm going to find a candidate location contains one or more uh, items. That might not be true. We should check if candidate if we should check if not candidate locations dot length and return and return uh, and do what? left and return left and top if uh, if that expression evaluates to true okay that's probably really unlikely I the only way I can think of that occurring is if like the whole screen is really tiny or it's just the user has peppered it with picture-in-picture -picture windows, which anything's possible, but um, we need to check. Oh, I see that a couple of, it looks like I had suggested the algorithm. Um, all right. I'm gonna say also knit. Do I care about the left and the top? You know what? I think I'm fine with it being an array. Left and top. That's fine. We're just, so long as it's documented, it's fine. Uh, and then do we have a test? I don't see a test for this. Um, and what was the other thing? There's something else that I saw. I think we can simplify this. Do, do we ever use conflicting pip rect again? Conflicting pip rect. I don't think we ever use it again. Oh no, we get the conflict location from it. So there might be an array um, method we can use here instead of the for loop. I think we can also do this with, I think there's something like array.prototype.first or find. Returns the value of the first element that satisfies the providing testing function. So you could do it like uh, player rects lang equals JS player rects dot find and then uh, rect uh, rect dot intersects new player rect. think let conflicting pip rect equal find the rect that intersects the new player rect. Let's add a comment block up here that describes the algorithm that we're going to use to find a candidate location, uh, find a, a proper location. Okay, so I'm going to request changes, but this is really great. Uh, this is great. Thank you, Hunter. Um, 
I have a few suggestions below, but this is looking, um, but I'm really liking the looks of this. We should also definitely write a test. Um, presume, uh, write an automated test. Uh, for this stuff. Something like open a new pip window, close that pip window to save its location, open that pip, uh, open a, a new pip window to open in the old location. Um, open a second pip window and ensure that windows do not overlap. It might be, it's probably pretty fragile to try to calculate the expected position of the newly created window in step four considering the variety of display sizes in our testing pool. So just testing that the windows never overlap is uh, windows don't overlap is probably sufficient. Okay. Changes requested. Man, so much traffic going on in one of my... Uh, Make sure we have enough. Sorry, I'm just going through and looking at some chat backlog to make sure there's nothing in there and there's no emergencies. There are no emergencies. All right, so we've done a review. Hooray! Um, I thought that was uh, really interesting. I didn't actually run the patch. That's another thing we could do is we could just test the patch. Um, let's see what my tree, what condition my tree is in right now. Oh boy, HG diff and Watchman. Watchman's unavailable. Um, okay, so looks like I was recently messing around with some stuff. I'm going to just revert all that. Oh. Okay, and now let's apply this patch and test it out. Just, just a little light test. Little light test. We're not going to do an exhaustive test here, but we'll use, here, let me uh, zoom in so you can see what I'm writing. Mozfab, patch, then the ID of the review. And then I'm going to say apply to here because I, I don't care to um, update to the revision that it was based on. All right, we applied cleanly. I see some kind of traffic in live hacking about a GIF. It's Tobias Funke, Funk from... Uh, from rest development i also see some other traffic um like watching nine hockey games during the playoffs that could, that is a totally plausible scenario totally plausible um or during march madness <laughs> uh, which is coming up which is coming up or like two huge pip windows yep that could happen uh, mr other guy asks would it be more useful to return some small offset of left top because so that the new one is less likely to cover the old window so uh, interestingly, that's what it's doing. It is offsetting the, uh, it's offsetting that position. If you look here, that's what's happening. Is like it's calculating the offsets um, of those four corners of the window, those four edges. It figures out the offset uh, based on the new player window dimensions. Hopefully, that answers your question, Mister Other Guy. All right, we've got our uh, patch applied. Let's build it real quick.
Okay, so the way we're gonna test this, it's we need to turn on multi-pip support. I think this is the one thing, oh, it's already on. This is the one thing, that and some telemetry that's blocking us turning this on by default in nightly. Uh, if we can, we could let this ride the trains in nightly and then we're just gonna see whether or not people use it. Multiple picture-in-picture -picture player windows. Uh, so let's open up some picture in picture player windows. Uh, I'm just gonna randomly open some YouTube videos. All right, and we're gonna open this one. And yeah, let's let's keep it in its position. And we'll keep it rather large. And then I'm gonna right click on this one. We're gonna oh, okay, I have to play it. And then I right click, choose picture in picture. Okay, so it looks like this one may have given up because there's actually no good position for it. So let's try that again. I'm gonna shrink this window down, put it here, and now check. See that? That's overlapping again. What if I put it here? Did I, did I apply the patch correctly? It doesn't appear to be uh, actually deconflicting. So that's an issue. Um, let's take a look in the debugger. Uh, conflict. Yeah, so it looks like the code is here. Let's see if we're, we're hitting it. We are not hitting it. <laughs> so what's the dealio? Um, Resolve overlap conflicts isn't being called. Um. I'm not sure what's going on here. Did I uh did I not build? Did I not do mock build? I may not have done mock build. I I thought I applied it and I did mock build faster. And then mock run. What's going on here? Let's let's try running this again. A lot of errors in there too. Okay, let's open up our browser toolbox. Let us step through this stuff. Picture in picture. Dot JSM. Oh, I have to actually invoke it in order to. Um, okay, so it should now be available, picture in picture dot JSM. And now I will um, resolve conflict. Where is that function? Conflict. So this is, I am breaking here and I want to break in here just in case. So this should, I think, cause us to hit our breakpoint, which we do. Okay, great. So we do enter resolve conflicts. We open this window. Okay, okay. Now let's open a different player window. I'm gonna shrink this one down. Writing. I'm going to open this one up. We hit our breakpoint again. Okay, good. But we only hit the first one. Why didn't we hit the second one? Let's do that again. Okay. So we do enter here, weirdly. We're going to see if we get any. We got a conflicting rect. We center it. We're going to check. The candidates, the screen rect does not contain the candidate. I guess it checked, what one would it have checked first? Left edge. Candidate location Y, 234. Candidate location X is minus 196. I don't think that is correct. I think we are doing some bad math here. 
edge coordinates. So the let's do this again. Okay. What is going on here? Play. Did I crash? I crashed. <sighs> All right. Um, let's take a quick look at this mathematics. Picture.jsm, geometry.point. So we're taking in this rect of each player. We're subtracting the candidate width. Am I just doing this wrong? Okay. Let's put this in the bottom left or bottom right. And then let's open this somewhere. See, that's overlapping. That's wrong. Let's do that again. Solving the conflict. So the left edge of the pre existing window is here. And then we are going to get the candidates. The pre existing rect, the new player width is 129. One, okay. So yeah, it'd be somewhere over here. That makes sense. Does the screen rect contain it? Screen rect. Bottom right, left, 36, contains candidate rect. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. And no, it doesn't. So the problem is that the screen rect doesn't contain. It, it's claiming that the screen rect never contains the candidate rect. Get avail screen size on the conflict screen. Saying that the width and the height, but the screen rect is. Top 23, bottom 1080. It doesn't contain it. Candidate rect is undefined. Wait. That doesn't make sense. Let's play again. Let's do this again. Okay, play. I guess we don't need a breakpoint there anymore. Play, play. What is going on? I thought I put a breakpoint here. What is happening? And it crashes. I don't know what's going on with uh, Nightly today. There is some funkiness. Abnormal shutdown. OK, well, at least I'm going to report this to the the the, can the writer. Hey, uh, Jones, Hunter, I just tried this patch. And I'm having some uh, behavior some odd behavior where the candidate rects are never existing within the screen rect 
have you tried uh, running this patch or testing this patch with multiple displays? All right. Uh, what do we want to do now? I think I might want to go back to some of the stuff we were looking at last week with strings, uh, title case, sentence case. Uh, originally, I thought I would do some WebRTC stuff, but given how much time we have left, I don't think that's going to get us anywhere. Uh, I think we won't we won't get anywhere. So instead, uh, well, first of all, let me hook up the links uh, here I put that in here and I'll put the link to the no info so I'll put the link to the bug that I was reviewing reviewing patch for such and such I'll share this in case you want to see it copy link there aren't many things keeping me from uh, leaving Evernote. It's, I found it really spammy lately, but this is one of the things, the easy sharing um, and synchronization, but particularly sharing content out is, is kind of a killer feature for me. Okay, so that's, that's done now. Hopefully you'll be able to see that reflected in the agenda. Okay, strings. So uh, what I wanted to look at today was um, related to Firefox accounts. So you may or may not be familiar with the Firefox accounts uh, button. Um, it exists. There's like a whole uh, Firefox accounts submenu inside of the app menu. And we want to put those strings into sentence case. But in order to, to do that, we have to do a little bit of cleanup of our strings. In particular, we are we are moving away from Sync as a brand name. For the longest time, Sync was like the name of a product. It was a feature, and it had like a capital S, and it wouldn't be translated. So if you were using an Italian version of Firefox, it would be like Italian, 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 Sync in English. The word Sync capitalized because Sync was a brand name, like the word Firefox or Mozilla. We're going to move away from that. You know, synchronizing, syncing, we suspect is something that is like there are verbs in other locales um, that can replace the word sync. And we, we were moving away from sync as a brand. What well, we have are Firefox accounts that you can sync to as a verb, as opposed to Firefox sync as a, or sync as a product. So um, the first thing we need to do is we need to simplify a bunch of our um, sync brand strings uh, and just drop them all together. And then we're going to convert all of those uh, strings to fluent. Um, because our localizers are going to need to translate them anyways, and so might as well make them use the new uh, better system. And then um, we'll let that land, hopefully soon-ish, to give our localizers an opportunity to do translations, and then we're going to write patches to put the strings in a sentence case. Um, and I got some feedback from Flaud, who said that that sounds like a great plan and reduces the risk and impact on localization. So let's do that right now. So I started to um, calculate all of the different, um, here I can prune that change. Uh, I'll probably want to actually apply it here because that is likely to land first. These sentence casing string uh, patches are unlikely to land until we're all ready to flip them all at the same time. So I'm going to put it there. Um, and I started taking notes about all these different uh, strings. You know, the IDs of the elements that use them, the actual strings themselves, where they are, are they fluent or not. And one of the things that we need to look at is the uh, things like this, set up sync with a capital S because that's using the sync brand stuff. So let's take a look and see how that works. So here's an element that has a label that says FXA menu set up sync label. So that's the key of the translation string that goes in. And if we look at the definition of that translation string, it's set up sync brand short name label. 
So what I want to do is um, this. I'm going to go into this file, browser.dtd. I'm going to find this usage. First of all, I'm going to see if there are any, uh, how many usages are there in here. There appear to be, uh, find all, how many? Six matches. So we're going to basically replace all of the uses to just be the word sync. Still with the capital, but we're going to stop the indirection. So that's easy. I'll just do sync settings. Turn on sync. Set up sync. Whoops, see Daisy. Sign into sync. Turn on sync. I probably should just do find and replace, actually. I don't know what I'm doing all this manual stuff for. Sync. All right. And then we can get rid of sync brand short name label. Uh, are there any other uses of that? No. No. There's another definition of it inside something called syncbrand.dtd, but that doesn't matter here. So we're just going to get rid of that entity. And now all of the things that we just changed, we're going to try and convert them to Fluent. Um, so that means converting all of these. Oh, and then there's sync brand FX account label. That's interesting. Sync brand FX account label. What is that? Firefox account. That is still something that we're going to keep using like that 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 is something that we're going to keep but anything that's using sync brand not the account brand but the sync brand that's what we're going to convert okay so now that we've updated all of these we're going to update them and migrate them to fluent uh, and we don't have to write a fluent migration because we're actually asking our translators to retranslate these because for them um, sync is no longer a um, a brand name. Oh, this is gonna be tricky. Sync is no longer a brand name, so we're asking them to translate it into whatever makes sense in their locales. Um, you know, in in place of this word. Okay. So let's start by uh, taking a look to see where this one is used. FXA menu sync settings to label. That's used here. And so I think what I want to do, there is a browser FTL. Uh, and I'm probably going to do um a sync section like fxa menu sync settings label now there might also be a better ftl to put these in ftl are there any that have to do with sync browser sync.ftl i think this might be a better place for them actually and where do we use sync.ftl? Okay. So I think that's what I'll do. Instead of putting it inside of browser FTL, which is kind of like this catch all, I'm going to put it inside sync.ftl. And we'll call it FXA menu sync settings equals label equals and it used to be sync settings so that's what we'll put in here so now I just have to find the place where this was originally used browser.xhtml Whoops. Oh man, what was that entity called? 
FXA menu, sync settings to label, copy that. So we have to find the place that it was being used. Instead of using the label, we're going to use data L10N ID equals. And then we'll say FXA menu sync settings. And we'll also need to ensure that the FTL file is actually in here. So it doesn't look like there's any um, order to this. I'll just add it to the bottom. Browser slash sync.ftl. OK. So that should work. Um, let's see if we can make sure. So that's inside of a toolbar button in the panel. Uh, let's build this and take a look. SmurfD says, will you first go from sync brand name to sync and then maybe to synchronize or, or will it stop at sync? Good question. Uh, I don't know. That's not really my call. Uh, I don't get to... I, it's not really my job to pick the strings that end up being used. Um, we have like a whole team of people under the UX team whose job it is to figure out what the right words are to communicate certain things. Um, oh, start new session, please. All right, let's see if we can find this element. Document get element by ID. Um, what was it called? Panel UI prefs button. Oh, you know what? I think I need to, yeah, it's lazy, that menu. So there it is. And yeah, sync settings. The label has been set. Booyah. Um, so we, we're on our way. We got started. That's the job. This is going to be a very sort of straightforward meat and potatoes um, bit of work here where we just start converting these things. And thankfully, we don't have to use... Um, we don't have to use um, migrations on this. Turn on sync. <sighs> All right. So turn on sync. FXA menu, turn on sync. Menu, what was it called? Turn on sync equals dot label. And it's just turn on sync. And then we're going to get rid of this entity. And then in all the places it's used. Oh, I see there are two places. Hmm. Label and default label. Value and default label. What's default label? I guess we stash some set to its original state. Okay. Um, that's wild. Um, so the label. Okay. Well, what we can do here is we say uh, data L10N ID equals um, this. And then we tell it what attributes it's going to fill out. And the reason for that is, hang on, document l10n.ccp. There's something that's like overlay. Translate elements, localization, 
overlay. There are certain things that we kind of get by default with overlays. Um, if you're using Zool. Yeah, so for Zool, title, tooltip, label, access key, aria label. Uh, if the tag is a description, oh, okay. If the tag is a label, then we'll automatically do value. So we don't have to add data Elton and attributes for value to make value take the, um, the value. And in fact, this should be value. But we will need one for default label. Uh, so we're going to say default label. And then we can use uh, interpolation and say FXA menu turn on sync dot value. That should work. So we're just we're saying, hey, just point to this value uh, right here. Uh, so it's like the default is built in by the translating system. OK, and then we can get rid of these attributes. And we're going to do the same thing for this other one. Um, setup sync, which I think has the same issue, right? No? All right, well, we'll, we'll do this one first, actually, because it's similar. Uh, yeah, sign in to, oh, brand product name. That one actually doesn't need to be changed. We can, we can keep that the way it is. So we'll just leave that. Um, okay, well, let's change this other one then. Uh, this one looks straightforward. Set up sync label. Um, is set up sync. And the ID was FXA menu set up sync label. FXA menu setup sync label. And so we will now take that. Uh, well, I guess we can get rid of this entity. And we're going to say data L10 ID equals FXA menu setup sync. Right? Yeah. OK. And then the next one that we changed was these two. At menu remote tab, sign into sync. Sign into sync. This is for the app menu. So uh, we have a, sp a special uh, FTL file for the app menu. We'll use that. Um, Firefox accounts. Say app menu remote tabs. Remote app menu remote tabs sign it into sync label. And that one is just sign into sync. Okay. And then the origin or the user of this entity. Label. Uh, we're going to pass it this one instead. Get rid of that. And I think that was the only one, right? Oh, no, there was one here as well. So data L10 ID equals sign to sync. Booyah. 
Next one is turn on sync dot label. App menu, remote tabs, turn on sync label. Okay. App menu, remote tabs, turn on sync equals label. And we will copy that. Copy that. There's just the one. Data L10 and ID equals this key and we get rid of this and we get rid of this okay yeah it was just the one usage right I guess I should do a couple double checks make sure it's not being used whoops see Daisy um, it wasn't being used elsewhere was it yeah I, I wouldn't think so I'm not gonna do it for the other ones I'm sure it's fine Okay, what was the next one? Um, then we got rid of the brand. So that should do it for this batch. We've gotten rid of all of the branding in here. Sync brand. Oh, no, we've got one here. How did I miss this one? Sync brand. F oh, because that's the FX account. And that's okay. That we want to still use sync brand. All right. Uh, what's next? So that should have taken care of a number of these. Let's see uh, what other ones need to be converted to fluent. Set up sync, sync tabs, panel UI, FXA menu. That would have all been in browser.dtd. So let's see if we can find sync brand dot sync or short name. Find other uses. It's all inside of browser DTD. Okay. Sync brand. What else? New install. Sync brand FX account. That's fine. I think that means we can get rid of sync brand short name label here inside of sync brand.dtd. And that should have us no longer using sync brand. Um, stock type. We still need it here, these two for the other strings. Okay. Still using it for FX account there. Okay, so what about the other places where we might have defined a sync brand? Maybe properties? Sync brand, yeah, sync brand short name. So this might be a little trickier because with properties files, generally what we're doing is we're, we're manipulating strings with JavaScript. So let's see if we can find anyone using sync brand short name. Haha, <laughs> no one's using it. Great. Uh, that means we can just get rid of it, I believe. Um, actually, something comes to mind. Uh, our partners repackaged builds of Firefox like Tor have a Hmm. Are we aware of any packet uh, alternative forks of Firefox that might have a differently branded version of sync that might be impacted by these changes? Hey, Al, uh, A. Davis. I don't think that should block this effort, 
but we might want to reach out to them to let them know it's happening. I don't know if um, A. Davis is the right person. Maybe Sylvest? Hey, Sledrew. Not sure if you're the right person to ask, but I know you work with, you have your feelers in some distros. We are ever alternative. What's happening? Okay. Right. So we can start getting rid of sync brand short name inside of brand properties. We don't need it here. Uh, or in nightly brand dot properties. Nightly doesn't need it. Uh, official doesn't need it. And unofficial doesn't need it. Is there a last one? Beta? Any of these still have it? No, we're good. That's all of them. Okay. So that gets rid of all of the sync branding inside of DTDs that I'm aware of, inside of properties. And now we have Fluent. So there's some pre existing, um, pre existing Fluent uh, work that was done on sync, and they brought over the sync branding. So let's take a look and see if we can find mentions of a sync brand. I think, yeah, sync brand short name. So sync dash brand. Sync can be localized. Firefox must be treated as a brand and kept in English. Oh, that's interesting. Sync brand name. Well, I'll deal with this second one later. This one seems easier. We're going to get rid of in sync brand.ftl. We're going to get rid of this. Uh, OK. So about logins.ftl. We're going to replace all of the uses. We're going to use find and replace with the word sync. So replace, 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 replace. Done. And then menu bar. Turn on sync. And then AS router. I guess I can do find and replace here too. Replace, replace. Okay. Uh, preferences. Replace, 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 replace. Protections. FTL. Is it in here? Did I get that wrong? Protection, turn on sync on tool, browser components, protections, locales, in US. The heck? Browser, locales, in US, browser protections. Browser components, protections, content protections. Is there a different protections? The FTL? I guess there is. All right. Find and replace. Replace. Done. 
What's next? Whoopsie daisy, did I accidentally? Yeah, okay. And now sync.ftl. Replace. Uh, and then synced tabs.ftl. And that, I believe, gets rid of all of the branding. Meaning that, like, like the it, the strings have not changed, but it gets rid of the flexibility. It gets rid of the 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 mechanism that we've been using to ensure that no matter what, that string appears the same. So now we can tell our localizers, hey, you can now use that word. Like, you can find an appropriate word in your locale. Um. Okay. Let's see. Sync settings. And then maybe we also want to do the work. Do we... Hang on, let me reread the bug. Fold the sync brand strings and strings that are firm and drop the sync brand strings altogether. Can very strings that are originally using sync brands to fluent? Since our localizers we need to retranslate them anyways. Pass both strings to send case where appropriate, targeted for next release. Okay. So this first chunk, we might be done. Like, let's just take a quick peek here. Let's make sure we don't get a yellow screen of death after we build and run. And we'll just kind of like sniff around. We'll open up preferences. We'll open up this, the accounts menu. Make sure nothing explodes. Um, I don't see why, to, why I would, but just in case, here we go. So no yellow screen of death, that's good. Sign into Firefox, sync, sync to tabs. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, preferences, sync is here. Sign into sync, right. So these are all just strings now instead of this branding. Um, sync to tabs, sign into sync, yep. Yeah. Okay, feeling, feeling good. Oh, wait, fluent missing translations update dot downloading. That seems unrelated. Who's trying to use that? Update downloading. Hmm. Undefined. I'll file a bug about that later. All right. Uh, I think I'm ready to take a look at this and post it for review. So we bring in sync.ftl, convert a couple of things to fluent, get rid of the sync branding. And is this going to affect all of them? Like, are there any that I missed? I guess I'll probably need to do like a deep dive into each of these. Like, let's just pick one in particular. Synced. Synced tabs. Well, sync, it's not using the brand name. If you synced tab sidebar, like that can now be sync now. Panel UI sync now is using FXA toolbar sync now. 
So it was never using the branding in the first place. Um, so it seems like there was already this move away. One of the things I noticed actually while I was doing this, um, sync brand.ftl, I noticed this comment. Sync can be localized. Firefox must be treated as a brand and kept in English. So, oh, yeah, this is the one we did not do. Um, sync brand name. Who's using that? First time using Firefox Sync? I think I'll need to understand what to do here. I don't actually know what the right first time using. You'll need to sign into every installation of Firefox to sync your information. It's possible that because Firefox sync and sync can be localized that it's that this is kind of like a fuzzy case and that this is the brand and it's just like the brand name is Firefox plus the verb of synchronizing. Um, but I don't know. I'm going to have to ask about that. But I think I can create a commit right now. Um, it's like fold sync brand uh, entities into their parent strings and um, convert some to fluent. Flawed. So I'm going to ask Flawed what, what he thinks of that. Um, might actually be safer to rebase this on top of central. Pretty safe merging and then uh, getting review. But I also want to ask that question, submit tip. It says it's a secure revision because it hasn't figured out what the access policy for this patch is yet. It's still synchronizing with Bugzilla. So it defaults to being secure. So this is what a secure revision looks like if you've never seen one before. It's very normal. It just has these two warnings. Um, and then once it's synchronized with Bugzilla, I can ask my question. Actually, you know what I'll do is I'll need info um, in the bug. Hey, Flawed, do you know what we should do for this one? It's The comment suggests that um, sync can already be uh, translated. Do we just leave it as it is? How does this how does something like this work? Here's how it's used in context. Uh, sync brand name. And request review or need info from flawed. 
submit. Ugh, okay, I'm gonna back up, reload, and request information from flawed. Okay, and I think I'm gonna call it there. Um, so I, I realize this wasn't the flashiest of episodes. We did a little bit of reviewing. We did some mucking about with strings. This is all preparatory work for, um, you know, rejigging some of our menus, uh, updating some of the strings, and in particular, updating some of the casing of the strings. We need to kind of do a little bit of upfront work. Effectively, we need to like, because most of our local, most if not all of our localization community is um, volunteer, that we have to make sure that we don't overload them with work, that we don't de place demands, unfair demands on them, where we can try and do things with automation and where we can't give them plenty of lead time, plenty of opportunity to, to translate things. So that's why we're doing this uh, work sooner rather than later. But uh, yeah, let's call it there. Thank you so much for watching 200, uh, episode 237 of The Joy of Coding. Um, uh, we'll see. Next week, maybe I'll, I'll try and do something flashier. I feel like maybe these last couple episodes haven't been very flashy. Uh, maybe I'll find something flashier to do, a little more exciting. But I mean, you're, you're seeing what I would actually be doing for my day job. I'm just talking through it as I do it. Um... If you uh, let me know what you thought of this episode, there's a link inside the agenda to rate the episode. I'll actually put that link inside of Matrix Rate this episode. Yeah, this is effective. This is grunt work. That's exactly right. This is like regular, just meat and potatoes grunt work. It's not exciting or exploratory. And I apologize for that, but it's very real. You know, this is the sort of like, um, if you're building a house, this is like, it's not sorting nails or anything. It's more like, uh, I don't know, doing the initial measurements, cleaning up the space. Like, that is the stuff that you, we need to do, the preparatory work, before we get into the, sort of the, the deeper gunk. I promise you, in 2021, we're going to do some really interesting, flashy things. Uh, but sometimes it's also going to be like this. Uh, gunk, homework, grunt work. But let me know what you think. Uh, I've put the link to rate this episode in the live hacking matrix channel and Twitch chat. Smash that link and let me know what you think. And please, if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe if you'd like. If you're watching this on Twitch, subscribe or follow. How does that work? I don't know. Um, I'm I'm old and uh, not hip. So, uh, but we'll call it here. Thanks again, and I'll see you next week. From all of us here at The Joy of Coding, a.k.a. me, have yourselves a great week, and I'll see you next one. Take care. Bye-bye. See you.